Why don't you write when you don't need money, honey? That would certainly make a hit. And welcome back to Word Docs. I'm your host, Alex Vickery Howe. I am here with Dr. Amy Matthews. Hi. She seems surprised that I called on her then. And Dr. Sean Williams. Mm. Oh. Hello. <laughs> well, hello. Amy looked very thoughtful there. She had to consider her words carefully when you yes. introduced her. Deep consideration and then said hi. I got distracted. I got a <laughs> notification at the top of the computer and I got distracted, uh, to be honest. Well, you looked very deep. See, that's what you do. You just be distracted and you look deep. I've got friends like that. Everyone thinks they're deep and soulful, but they're just yeah, vague. Yeah, slow. <laughs> just really vague. Slow. Um, okay, while we're pondering the meaning of existence, this episode is all about... What is it about? What, what was the question that we found? Ego, is it helpful or not? And I sort of wanted to expand that to discuss... How is your writing affected by where you're at? This is such a deep, you know, psychological question. But probing. You're probing us with consent. Yeah, by where you're at, I guess, emotionally. How is your work affected by your mental state, I suppose, is the question. Wow, that is deep. Yeah. It is deep, isn't it? So who wants to leap into my hot seat first? <laughs> Oh. A- an invitation like that, who could resist? <laughs> I think both of you can. <laughs> it's like a bad late night talk show. Yeah. Um, should I go any, mini miny, mo? Is that the cruelest oh. way to do it? Because I like to go for the cruelest possible way. The cruelest possible way. Okay, go for it. Any, mini. Oh, we're doing the whole He's thing. He's actually doing it. He's oh, actually doing it. I can't shot. believe. Amy. Hey. All right. So we're talking about mental states and ego. Mm. and Yeah, I mean, it fluctuates so radically, I think. I mean, on one level, like, I really obviously believe that I've got something worth doing or you wouldn't do it, right? Mm. That you would have given up when it got hard. You obviously have to believe in yourself to get to the point where you have a career. But it does fluctuate. Like you have these really terrible days. You know, I've told the story so many times, that comment about being medium. Yes, yes. Oh, about, you know, yes. The book. But that is always in my head. And, and Sean and I keep bringing it up really insensitively yeah. quite <laughs> yeah. often. Everyone does. <laughs> Johnny We're not does helpful too. people, are we? No. <laughs> but I, you know that, I was thinking about that the other day because obviously, I'm having quite a successful career but it's a kind of medium career right like it's not I'm not at writer's week I'm not you know most people have never heard of you so although you're kind of publishing and you've got a career with a big publisher and you're doing okay it's kind of a medium career so that was going through my head this summer a little bit about being medium and obviously I've got enough of an ego where that pricks and then it kind of gets you a little bit unsettled and but I think there is something about being a writer and being a sensitive person Mm -hmm. like we're all I don't know because you have to be able to watch people I don't know because there are two kinds of writers in the world there are those who are um, just write about themselves over and over and then there are those who are interested in other people yes and I think I'm the second one more than the first one like, oh, I would definitely say I'm the second one if I had a superpower I'd want to be invisible really that's not creepy at all I, was gonna, I nearly said it I nearly said it do you know someone said that to me because it never occurred to me he was like oh people who want to be invisible like have criminal urges I was like no I literally what? just don't want people looking at me like mm. yeah because the idea that you could go and steal things, do things, I was like, that had never occurred to me. <laughs> I would mm. never do that. I, would, like, I just don't want to be looked at. Mm. The median thing is interesting too, though, because I think everyone has those thoughts and those thoughts are totally natural. But to be medium in a career like this, and I'm not even saying I buy into it, but, it, but it, you know, to be medium, let's say we accept that idea – it's still a huge win. Achievement. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. It's like it's massive yeah. to even mm. be functioning in a field like this. And But you know when you start out, all you want is to publish something. Yes. Yeah. That would be the biggest win and you're like, I'll be so happy when that happens. And then, of course, the bar keeps getting higher and higher. Goalposts keep shifting, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I also remember being an academic and saying to someone when I was a contract worker, I'd just be so happy to be a level B, like to just get an entry-level job and Mm. And she laughed and she was like, you won't be. You you want to get promoted and so And it's like, well, yeah, so the bar just constantly shifts. Mm. Mm. Like you're in a place for a while and you want to be better. What's that old saying? If you're not happy now, you, you never, never will, will be. be. Mm. <laughs> Which is a bit of a grim proclamation. Happiness is internal. So I think I'm generally happy, but we do have yeah. ego. Like you want people to recognize your achievements probably. And to love you. It's also interesting that, uh, God, choosing my words carefully after whiskey, sometimes, or I 
sometimes feel that things I've done that others may consider to be an achievement aren't enough for me. Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes that is a moment where you have to really check yourself and go, you know, what is it that is not making me completely happy or what is it that I'm still striving to reach for? And it's sometimes it's not even higher goals but different goals. Yeah, see, I don't feel like I've achieved everything I'm capable of. Mm. I know on, on a personal level I haven't achieved what I could do. Mm. So I think that always drives you on of like – but then like we've said before, there's only a certain number of hours in the day. And a certain mm. number of stories. You know, my friend Caleb Lewis, we were just looking up. That sounded creepy but I don't believe Caleb's a real person. Alex talks about Caleb. I've never seen him. I think he's imaginary so I did Google him. We did see him once. We saw him once on Skype but he had a bucket on his head so yeah. that doesn't really That's count. That's not proof. <laughs> it's probably Mal. Mal with the bucket. We've never seen <laughs> Alex and Caleb in the same room. <laughs> but he was saying, you know, every time you come up with a new story, you're putting another one back yes. by potentially yeah. ever or Absolutely. maybe at least by a few and years. And because they're you know? so slow. So there is that thing of time. Yeah, they're so slow. Um, so I think sometimes there's there's that. There's not enough hours in a day. There's not yeah. enough time to do what you want to do. So you have to start picking and choosing. How do some of these feelings around success or around ambition affect your writing? And do they come out in the writing? That's a really good question. That's a tricky question. Mm. Stump them, stump them. <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> when I, in a recent episode, was talking about the book that kind of uh, broke me, didn't break me, me being broken, broke the book. But it's a mixture of the two, really. And uh, the, the book was in my mind and I didn't write for a year or two afterwards, partly because I started at the university. But I think the the book was called In My Mind. The book was called In My Mind. Yeah, because when you just said the book was in my mind, I wasn't sure if you meant the title or... True. Yeah. It was in, I, I imagine the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, just like uh, Alex, I'm in a coma imagining my entire life. Um, I think I hit a weird sort of period in my career where perhaps I had had a sense that I'd kind of yeah. done everything that I'd wanted to do. But I, I think there was a sort of a collapse of my ambition at that point because I was mm. going through all sorts of other stuff. So uh, in that sense, sort of depression and chronic pain really did have a huge impact impact on my writing mm. impact because it made me not want to write because it, it uh, there was nothing that was making me want to write enough hard enough mm. that novel length at short form it's a lot easier to muster the energy for short form than it is for a, a full novel but uh, so that was an instance where certainly my state of mind affected my career and desire to write but that was the only time in my life that that's happened usually if I have to write something I'll you know raise myself up by my bootstraps and just do it that you is know? a really <laughs> interesting question too though that idea of you talked about that hunger like what drives you to write like something has to motivate mm. you to do it right so there is a level of ego there somehow and so when you mm -hmm. yeah. there are other things that <laughs> that make you not want to write more you don't do it but it's interesting to think why why mm. would you do this like what does it mean say you're J because jk rowling would still deal with this stephen king right if you've got all the money in the world like you're a billionaire you're not writing for money mm, anymore. doesn't matter and necessarily if you, had, you know 44 mm. new york times bestsellers you're writing for love are you still writing for that anymore like like, it, I guess it's about why you're doing it in a way. Well, there's, you know, a couple of thoughts. Um, going back to In My Mind, eventually sort of branched out into impossible music in a kind mm. of non-linear way. Or yeah, yeah, that's right. So the, what I chose to write mm. about was myself, mm. to, uh, to write about something that really mattered to me. And it didn't matter if yeah. anybody published that book. I was writing it just because I really, I needed to write it mm. in, a, in a way. So it became less about fulfilling a contract than doing something that mattered on a different level that was almost a, a cathartic kind of experience and up until that point in my career I'd never written wow. a book just for catharsis although every book yeah, has yeah, tons yeah. of me in it you know <laughs> mm. and sometimes they're cathartic in sort of smaller ways they feel very different those books too like as you're writing them they feel different yeah they feel a, well this one felt yep. a lot more organic to me it, it had a shape of its own that I had to tease out instead of yep. imposing a shape onto a story that's it so is it almost in a way that the state you were in led to that book How happening that otherwise it would have just been another gig and you would have just done the initial story. Yeah, probably. And I don't want to diminish the just another gig no, mindset. Uh, no, of course not. No, of course I know you don't mean that, but I would hate anybody to think that the books that I wrote under contract or say mm. Star Wars novels or whatever would, was just another gig. You know, every gig, as Amy said before, yeah. each book takes so much time. Mm. Just to treat it as just another gig would be crazy. Yeah, that's right. Just another child, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. But, uh, but it seems like something kind of happened in that moment that changed the plan I guess is what I'm mm. what I'm sort of describing I sometimes feel that uh, sorry you might have heard a creaky door behind me that was my father <laughs> disobeying my orders coming out of the closet <laughs> how dare he <laughs> 
Yeah, you're supposed to stay in the wardrobe until after we've finished the podcast. <laughs> I, I sometimes think that the impulse to write for me is not that dissimilar to whatever strange self-destructive impulse gets me on Twitter because uh-huh. it's partly about, you know, a lot of people over Christmas I've noticed on there have been talking yeah. about their Twitter families and mm. I, I couldn't have done this without my Twitter family. Thank goodness for my Twitter family, etc., etc. And I think there's something in that is that desire to kind of reach out and meet people that are not in your orbit mm-hmm. and connect with those people. And I think that Twitter acts in that way. And in a similar sense, I think writing books can scratch that mm. itch, if you know what I mean. Like, I'm going to tell a story that may not appeal to those closest to me. Like, it, mm. they may not. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm writing things that mum and dad won't like and some of my friends won't like, but they will reach out to a world that I can't physically yeah. connect with. Mm. Um, I think there's something in that, perhaps. And and if you're in a mental state that is perhaps a bit angry or a mental state that is perhaps a bit confused or, you know, you're, you're in a place that you're not quite sure of things, then writing does become a cathartic exercise in yeah. reaching out, yeah. I think. Does that make any sense? Mm. It does. Yeah, it does. It's an act of communication and mm. uh, you've got to, I guess, assume that there will be somebody on the other end that will want to hear what you're trying to communicate. You hope so. You know, you hope so. Do either of you ever think that in some way you're writing to your younger self that you're writing to the young you who used to read those books mm. constantly yeah, yeah same it's like it's interesting like he's my first reader in lots of like books. we're all often kids who were quite sensitive right like we're slightly off beat right as i think often and so i do think there's an element of writing to ourselves like those kind of vulnerable kids that we were and sort of because then mm. we all found books right where or, or movies or shows that were written by someone which kind of mm. said you are not the only one you're not the only one feeling this you're not the only one going so it's mm. a kind of like reaching through time to your old the self you were but also to someone out there who might be going through what you were going through yeah who might be similar yeah yeah. that's why i like comic cons and those kinds of events because there is a kind of group solidarity in a lot of those forums i mean sean you might know more about this than i do but there's a a kind of community that starts at a kind of fun level of you know we're all wearing the same outfits or what have you but very often at those events very quickly goes to something deeper i think romance is the same yeah. Right. And speaks yeah. to a kind of need for human. Mm. That's what you're saying with the Twitter thing is this need for yeah. not just connection, but, but recognition that we have the same vulnerabilities and flaws and um, fears and all of that stuff. So it's the, it's the other side of the ego question, right? It's recognizing the bruised part of the ego mm. that we all share. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good way of saying it. And, you know, I think if you live, for example, uh, in a very yeah. conservative community somewhere in the world, you know, a lot of the people that are in red states but want to find like-minded souls that are probably yeah. nowhere near them geographically they will reach out and i'm sure that happens in you know for, it would happen the yeah. other way as well as, of course you know you might be in a really progressive area and you just you want to find your people i mean a lot of it is about finding your people and using like you were talking about metaphor before using metaphor so like say conservatives reading vampire books to explore sexuality or like using a mm. metaphor as a way of reaching those kinds of self-awarenesses yeah mm-hmm. yeah totally and uh, so in that sense, I guess it kind of touches what, on why I wanted to discuss this in this episode, which is sometimes the best work comes yep. out of a bad place. Yes. I think. I think that's really interesting. And sometimes some really awful yeah, work comes yeah, out of a really yeah, smug that's place. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. You know, I am the best writer ever. Watch me write this terrible book, you know. Because you can pick smugness, actually. That's so <laughs> true. And I think that's often, you know, when you see really brilliant writers, like young writers who are who have the thing and they're so polished and good, but their work is a bit smug and comfortable and mm. yeah, and self-aware. Just, there's mm. a kind of built in sneering at the other humans. Like I look, I win. I'm better, and I think that always mm. puts me off. Yeah, that kind of ego is death for the reader. I think on the whole, I don't think there are some readers who like that kind of thing. But I wonder if they're the same kind of people. Yeah, because they want to be in on the smugness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you, do you yeah. let me ask you two? You, you've been in the writing system longer than I have, do you see much of that smugness coming through students? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, all the time. I've got uh, drama students. What are you talking about? Oh, of course, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> Alexia, dumb question. I think with writing students, 
it often fades a bit. Like they can come in in first year, but even in honours, you can see see the smugness. But in a PhD, for example, it gets beaten out of them pretty quickly, I think. And published authors too. I actually have friends who have published authors who had success really quickly mm-hmm. and they do get a little bit smug. But like we've said before, everyone's career has ups and downs and everyone goes through this introspection of maybe you've bitten off more than you can chew and you're with a project which isn't working or fails or gets bad reviews mm. or if you're a PhD student you hit mm. you hit the second year where it's just rough like the second year slump <laughs> you just plummet or you're yeah. you know in third year of an undergraduate degree and you're being asked to write outside like change point of view or change genre and it's it suddenly you find the limitations of what you can do and we all hit that moment of the edge of our smugness right we all hit that moment yeah. and so yeah I do think you see smugness in students but I also think you see the vulnerability like you see that what's behind the smugness mm. is a kind of desperation to be recognized yeah this kind of front that you often get I think when I was a young writer I used to say perhaps reaching to myself for this observation that uh, uh, writers often had huge egos but very poor mm. self-esteem mm. and I'm not sure what the difference is between ego and self-esteem but I think that's what you're describing yeah there. yep Amy, yes. maybe that uh, ego is the front and self-esteem is the the bruise absolutely I think you probably see it really clearly in performance majors because they're very mm. good at mm. performing ego but you can sort of see straight through it and go you're really scared to death right now but you're doing a very good job of seeming confident you know yeah. and fair enough because as we've talked about before these are all forms where you're getting criticized constantly I mean I know like a neurosurgeon mm. really life or mm. death or any kind of you work in an emergency room you're getting judged too and <laughs> the harshest review of all is a flat line that's oh that's right. awful or being like a you know mountain <laughs> yes. climber like you you put a foot wrong you're gonna die it's a harsh review too well, at least you don't have long to regret that mistake <laughs> yeah so I, I'm not saying we're special I think other people have much harder times of it mm. but you are in an industry mm-hmm. where you are being judged like it's pretty brutal to send your work out you get pretty harsh criticism sometimes and even just getting a standard form rejection is pretty brutal right it's like I wasn't even good enough mm. for you to engage with the work you just went nah not for me mm. I'm increasingly amazed at how that can go both ways though like <laughs> I, there are things that I just go what you went for that yeah that was awful and you'd, and you'd rejected that thing I'd put my heart and soul into but you picked <laughs> up that thing over there what are you mad so that kind of helps are we back to your dating strategies again <laughs> <laughs> it kind of helps though because you go oh, look if it's random either way I won't let my ego get pumped up when it goes well and I won't be deflated yeah. when it goes badly I'll reflect yeah but I won't I won't get wounded and that's a great strategy when when anything's published or put out into the world in, in a play or a movie form I mean there is a roll of the dice every time something's put in front of the public and yeah and there may be times you'll think why did my brilliant book disappear and why did that mm. piece of crap rise up to the top it's just chance or a, to a large degree chance and I think that's very timing yeah timing as well of course and that can be very balming is that a it can, it yeah, can soothe word, isn't it? the bruised <laughs> ego a tad that's useful because you don't want to have your ego destroyed yeah because then you just stop writing but it is certainly mm. true like to go back to that smugness too much ego is a problem like you need enough ego so you were saying Alex you know why didn't they pick my brilliant book and, and Sean as well mm. and you need an element of that to, to sometimes believe in a work that actually is really good and other people people can't see how good it is because yeah. there are a lot of brilliant books that didn't get published you know got rejected a hundred times and then finally got published and found readers who were like this is the most amazing thing ever yes so you have to believe in you have to have enough ego to go yes this is good like i don't care what everyone's telling me this is good because we'll never know how many brilliant books got rejected once yeah and were put in a drawer a lot i think a lot i think oh, so I think too very many yes Millions. absolutely but then you need like it is kind of appalling I, you meet all the time people with these hugely inflated egos that I actually don't this goes back to the self-esteem thing it's not really ego so much as kind of narcissism Mm. because narcissism is of course like a psychological self-defense for Mm. people who not all of them like some people who've been abused or people who they've needed to construct this shell to protect themselves Mm. and you meet them all the time these people who will not take criticism or advice or you know they may even come to you for 
constructive criticism, but they don't want to listen to it. Mm. Um, and they actually psychologically, sometimes you recognize in people they psychologically can't listen to you. They can't take on any. Mm. It's too much, like they're too fragile. And so mm. it's kind of a, I really feel for editors and agents and publishers because yeah. you're dealing with people's, it's the same as with us dealing with students, you're dealing with people's quite intense psychology. Yeah, I think it's mm. very complicated territory. And I think on the other side of it too, you know, I've taken some brutal feedback from people I respect and gone... Yep. Yeah, me too. That's completely right. Um, I've also had brutal feedback and gone, you know what? I don't really rate this person. Yeah. And that's hard. <laughs> that's hard. Because then you go, what do I do? Do I push back or do I, you know, that's hard. And sometimes I think, I think Sean said this previously, you just have to walk away for a few days. Mm. Yeah. And then you come back to it and you go, you know what? That actually isn't even the hard, the hard knock I thought it was. No. But and again, I guess it's what nerve they've hit, right? Yeah. I've often thought the stronger my emotional reaction to criticism, the more likely it is to be true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Because otherwise I would just go, nah, you're wrong. But if they've mm. hit and I get upset, then I have to think, okay, why am I so upset by it? Mm. Am I afraid it's true? Like what? Is, what's going on there? I'm reminded of Gene Wilder. Is it Young Frankenstein, the Mel Brooks film? Mm-hmm. It, Gene Wilder had the idea that Frankenstein would sing and dance to Putting on the Ritz, the, the old <laughs> song. And, and I think Mel Brooks went, Putting on the Ritz? Why do you want to do that? And Gene Wilder just kept arguing, going, no, I want Frankenstein. Stein to do putting on the Ritz and after a while Mel went you've argued about this for so long that I think we're going to have to make Frankenstein do putting on the Ritz you know so so sometimes there's there's benefit in that but I'm also reminded of another story which is Joss Whedon was asked maybe by Rove I might, we're talking about Rove off air but who said you know did you think that Buffy the Vampire Slayer would be a hit and the answer I thought was brilliant which is you have to be that crazy mm. or you'd stop because yeah. mm. it wasn't a hit was it he made the movie and it was a massive flop. It was a flop. And, and he still didn't give up. Mm. Yeah, it kept going. And so I think you have to be a little bit nuts in yourself or, or nuts enough to say, this is worth me getting up every day, putting on a pot of coffee and uh, persevering with, you know. And sometimes it's not. Like Sean said about that, you know, when you had that horrible time with that book and you stopped, sometimes it's mm. not worth it. Sometimes you have to stop. Yeah, sometimes you need to let it go. And so knowing that is really important too, actually being self-aware enough. Because you know the the world the history of writers is littered with stories of writers in psychological distress mm. alcoholism marriage is falling apart and it's not worth any of those things mm. no not if writing is causing it and and certainly if writing is making those things worse then you shouldn't pursue the writing really it might be better to put aside for a bit and I guess that is a kind of that decision requires a kind of confidence yeah. in yourself yeah. and in your writing and in your career too if either of you ever walked away you know, everyone knows I have but uh, walked away from a gig. Um, I, I, I don't. I won't tell anyone what this gig was. But I walked. To, I, I had a day not that long ago where I just thought, you know what? I'm happy with everything I'm doing. I don't need this other thing. Yeah. And that was oh, quite yeah. an empowering moment of actually, I'm really happy with where I'm at, and this particular job mm. is just a pain in the neck. And there's a logical part of me that says, what are you mad? Why would you let that thing go? And then there's another, I suppose, emotional part of me going, or maybe there's a logic to this as well, but just going, you know what? Everything's fine. Why am I doing this? You know, have you ever had that? Yep. Oh, yeah. And I think you have to, again, confidence, ego to be able to say no. Because when you're starting out and there's a sort of a desperation, that hunger is very strong. You say yes to everything. Yeah. It's not a bad philosophy, you know, as long as it's ethical Mm. and doesn't harm you. Well, I I got offered, before I got the Western deal with Penguin, I got offered a chance to do another bit of writing. And it Mm. was really prescriptive and it would have come with being quite well known in Australia. And I turned it down and a friend of mine was like, what do you you doing are you mad and I was just like it's not what I want to do mm, like it's yeah. not what I ever wanted to do it's not a genre I was ever interested in it's not like they were hiring me as because I can just write like they just wanted to mm. slot someone in and here's the story and off you go mm, yeah. and I that wasn't my thing and and yeah you have these moments so when I worry about being medium it's like well I know I have I could turn around and be known in Australia mm. if I wanted to but I'm not yeah. interested in doing those things no and that that kind of decision takes an extreme level of 
ego that uh, I think is something to be really proud of. Yeah. To know what you want to do, what, you, what you're prepared you to are. do and what you're prepared to say no to. It's very hard to say no when someone's asking you to do something that you would have been so excited about at some point. Mm. I know. At the beginning of your career, just to write anything would have mm. been, yeah, I don't know. But you get older, don't you? And you have different goals. As a cynical uh, exercise once, I, I think I may have mentioned this on this podcast before, I wrote the cliched Australian screenplay. Like I just put everything in there. Did say this. And it was starting to, people were starting to respond to it. And I went, I can't do that. I can't, I can't actually, I didn't have an ending for it. So that made it easy. But it, I just went, oh, that's yeah. actually, it's an interesting moment where you go, I could, I could do that. But it's interesting that you tried that exercise, but you tapped into something that was real because people are responding to it. Yeah, that's and right. I wonder if there's part of you that wants to write a story that contains those elements. It was, it was such an empty story. Like there was nothing into it. Like it was literally <laughs> just long lingering glances and landscape. And I was just having fun. <laughs> and I thought, oh God, this is, this is the Emperor's New Clothes. Like this is, this is exactly <laughs> what this is. Couldn't do you it. You could have taken the advance of the funding money and or done whatever. something else. Yeah. Yeah. But we've talked about this in terms of work too and research mm. and that you spend so much of your life doing this, like so many hours a day and a week and a year and years of your life doing this. And you could mm. do the cynical thing and do, you know, check the boxes to kind of be a success. Mm. But you have to spend those hours doing that thing that might bore you. Yeah, that's right. And then you might, you look back at it and go, what did I do that for? And then if it's a huge hit, you just have to do it for the rest of your career. <laughs> yeah. really over stuck. and over yeah. and over. Oh. And people will wonder why you're an embittered al- alcoholic who complains about everything. Yes. That's right. How terrible would that be? Yeah. You create your own your own prison in a way. Yeah, definitely. As that. Alex and Amy say, lifting their scotch glasses. <laughs> We're not we're not embittered alcoholics. Uh, we're cheerful alcoholics. There's a difference. Cheerful, yeah. I love what I do. Mm. I think we all love what we do, don't we? Mm. Lucky yeah. bastards. We are inc- we are incredibly lucky. lucky. There's no doubt about that. In everything that we're saying, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting me in a way because I think, am I writing something at the moment which is just about my own mental state and not about commercial application <laughs> whatsoever? And is that perhaps um, a, a step too far the other way? I don't know. You never know what like what will no. be. Successful. Successful. You just have no idea. Your 360,000 word great whale novel, that's that's going to be <laughs> yeah. huge, Alex. There must be people around Melville going, we don't care about whales. We don't care. And he went, no, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. It's going to be huge. They'll be talking about this in 200 years, mate. I've got six extra chapters. Wait till you read them. The one about Verdigree. <laughs> oh, it's a knockout. Oh, man. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure what the time is telling me because we my time is a bit off. But um, I think the time is time. The time is time. We're coming towards the it's end. the end. End of the, line. the end of the line. That's our new slogan. So I think this has been deeply introspective, <laughs> but I think it's healthy to kind of go there every now and then and, and um, really dissect ourselves and each other. Not really. I mean, metaphorically dissect <laughs> ourselves <laughs> and each other. We're getting into real noir territory there. And this piece here is the weenus. Uh, is that our first weenus of 2021? It's our first weenus of 2021. Everyone playing weenus bingo. There you go. Check that one off. The word docs drinking game would definitely contain weird the yeah. weenus <laughs> train yeah Moscato <laughs> alcoholism chocolate uh, Johnny slapping Johnny yes yeah. yes <laughs> That's more of a recreational thing. We just do it in our spare time. <laughs> Poor Johnny. Well, as ever, it has been a pleasure. Um, I hope I haven't left you both psychologically damaged by asking those deep and probing questions. No. no. To everyone listening, um, we, we've got to work on our slogan for 2021. I don't feel like we've struck it yet. We haven't struck gold yet. It'll come organically. We'll try a new one every year. It'll come, well, well, for now, I'll just say, uh, see you, Mrs. Johnson. Oh, my God. That's terrible. That's disturbing. <laughs> Alex. That's not good. Good. Now I know why you don't work in advertising. That's so peculiar. <laughs> Doesn't Peter Gurr say something like "Good night, Mrs. Robinson" or "Good night, Mrs. Brown"? Wherever you are, yeah, does he? That's what I was well, going for. If we'd mentioned Peter Gurr's uh, local Adelaide personality at all in this episode, well, I'll, I'll say uh, "Good night, Mr. Gurr's wherever you are." Hope you're tucked in, nice and warm, in your teddy <laughs> with your teddy. I'm just going to say goodbye now. <laughs> goodbye, everyone. Doing somewhere sinister. <laughs> goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Why don't you write when you don't need money? All your notes sound alike too much. All of them start with I love you, honey, but they end with the same old touch. Just for a change, send a nice loving letter and cut out that please remit. Why don't you write when you don't need money, honey? That would certainly make a hit. 
Good night, Mrs. Johnson. Uh, I think we might have to record another ending to this episode. <laughs> well, Alex is choking to death. I'm sorry I took you to a dark place there. I think, in fact, when I was going to the dark place, I actually forgot what I was talking about halfway through, so I, I hope I actually made a cogent you point. You took us to the vague place. <laughs> the vague. I live in the vague dark. place. I'm it's in my dim in there. Now. It's dim and dusty and full of the smell of mothballs. <laughs> Mal, Mal lives in the vague place. Ah. I think I think Mal rules the vague place. All right. Um, right. This is might be the one where we, we just say? trail off. I don't know what we're we still say? going. Oh God, for the love of God! <laughs> it's not over till it's over, Alex. It's over. There, that's our sign off. It's over. Cue the music. Ego, Ego is, is not a dirty word. word. Yeah, oh. if you could get the rights to that, would be awesome. Oh, wouldn't that be great? It's such a great song. Mm. Well, it's an all right. It's song. a song. It's a bit media. Oh, t- that turned around pretty bloody quickly, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs>